in insisting that we not repeat the mistakes of the past and that the pressure will continue until North Korea matches its words with concrete actions. Thank you. All right, uh, that was a stunning statement. Let's just start with the most stunning part. Uh, that was the uh, National Security Advisor uh, for South Korea, Jong Ho Yong, and he is saying that in his meeting with President Trump, President Trump uh, expressed his eagerness to, um, er, I'm sorry, Kim Jong Un expressed his eagerness to meet President Trump as soon as possible, and President Trump responded saying yes. Not holding it out there whether he will, he said yes, he will meet Kim Jong Un and he will do so by May. That is an incredible thing, and I don't think there's anybody watching this or any expert on, on Korea who expected uh, that response at this time. Pretty stunning. Also, you heard uh, from the National Security Advisor of South Korea a lot of flattery from South Korea to the President of the United States uh, and saying that Kim Jong-un reiterating his position that North Korea would refrain from any more nuclear tests. Okay, there is so much to talk about here. Uh, Sam uh, Vinograd, who worked with President Obama, you've just said this was unprecedented in terms of getting this letter. Uh, let's just get to, Elise, the response. President Trump comes out and says, yes, I will meet with you. I will do it by May. That's right. I mean, look, President Trump wants to be the, lead, the leader that no, uh, he wants to do what no other leader has done, right? He wants to meet with Kim Jong-un, get a commitment from the North Korean leader. Um, and, you know, good for him for lowering the temperature, this maximum pressure campaign, as you saw mm -hmm. the uh, South Korean envoy flattering President Trump speaking to his, you know, uh, ego a little bit. Um, will someone say ego? Um, and saying, look, your leadership has brought you to this point. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, <clears throat> these talks that the U.S. would have with North Korea, if President Trump were to sit down with Kim Jong-un tomorrow, what would he say? I mean, there's no, and you talk to U.S. officials, yeah. there is no strategy for what they want from North Korea. How would this go? These kind of important summits, while... It would be historic. You would want to think that it was the groundwork was laid. And, you know, right. he's going to put his advisors and in a very tough position right now to prepare the ground for these talks. It's historic and it's very significant. Might be a little premature. I, I'm curious, General Marks, what you think of the president's strategy. You know, it, he had the option of saying, well, OK, I'll think about it. Let's see what you do, whether you actually keep your word or not. Then maybe I'll meet with you. But he didn't do that. He came out and said, yes, not only will I meet you, I'll do it by May. Is that the right strategy? Well, he said he was going to meet him by May, which is, I mean, I'm blown away here. I've got to tell you, yeah. I just take, took my tie and put it back down in front. because, <laughs> of, um, Frankly, t totally unprecedented. But I think what is not unprecedented should be our skepticism about how this thing is going to evolve. Mm -hmm. The president indicated he'll meet by May, but there are, as Elise pointed out, there will be preconditions. This has to be completely set up so the president doesn't walk in and is totally ambushed in, and walking away from what ends up being a stillborn outcome. There have to be preconditions, there have to be inspections if there is going to be a freeze on nuclearization in terms of missiles and tests, that has to be inspected. We have to be able to verify that this is moving in the mm. right direction. So there is a lot of green on that table, that pool table, between yeah. good intentions and uh, execution, but operations. But Phil, Phil this point where, where, you know, General Marks talked about being blown away. I mean, to say he'd do it and he'd do it by May, I mean, were you also stunned by that? Totally stunned. Absolutely. Oh, no, absolutely. I was not expecting this oh, yeah. announcement to include this. Yes. Sorry, Phil. Yeah, but let's put a couple of things on the table here because count me as a skeptic as well. Look, I don't yeah. have any problem with the White House trying to lower the temperature with the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. This is br better than the president tweeting that the, that the head of North Korea is little rocket man. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. Yeah. But Bush failed. Clinton failed, Obama failed. And let's look at the language that was just used a couple of moments ago on the beginning of this program, Aaron. They didn't say they would reverse, that is the, the, the South Koreans. They didn't say we had a promise from the North Koreans that they would reverse. No. They said they would refrain from future testing. What have we seen the past year or two? Yeah. The development of ballistic missile program mm -hmm. and nuclear testing, which suggests to me that they already have a capability. If I'm the North Koreans, I'm saying, I can deliver missiles and I can deliver right. nukes. Why not cement the progress I've made and have the Americans say, that's okay, right. let's talk. If I'm the president, I got two questions. What's on the table? And it doesn't sound le to me like uh, denuke. It sounds to me like freeze. And number two, yeah. 
What happens if you fail? I didn't hear either one of those. And, and Gordon, on this issue, right, the words from the North Korean, uh, I'm sorry, the South Korean uh, National Security Advisor were where they would refrain from any more nuclear tests. But obviously, you look at what happened to Bill Clinton, right? They, they agreed in uh, 1994 that there would be, that would be the end. And of course, that was broken. In 2005, they said they were going to end their nuclear program and allow inspectors under George W. Bush. And then in 2006, they went ahead with their first nuclear test. So that, that was worth a whole lot of nothing. It uh, happened again. And then under President Obama, uh, Kim Jong-un, for the first time, as the, as, as the leader of North Korea, reached out, said there'd be no more long-term missile launches, and they would halt activity at their major nuclear site. And guess what happened a year later? Their third nuclear test. So there's a track record here. It's very clear. They say they're going to stop nuclear tests, and then they just go ahead and do it whenever they're ready to do it next. Yes, there's something different, though. Um, you know, this time, uh, there are reports that office number 39, which is the Kim family slush fund, is low on funds. Hmm. And that's low on funds because of the accelerated testing of missiles last year. So I'm not surprised. I'm surprised by this whole thing. But the one thing that is not surprising is that the North Koreans are not going to test that much more. First of all, as Philip Mudd suggested, look, they've already gotten to a high level of uh, Right, because they can these. already do what they say they want to do? or because, I mean, that's a crucial question, right? It certainly is. But yeah. also, remember, they just don't have the money because President Trump's and the U.N. sanctions are really starting to bite. And we have a lot of anecdotal evidence. The most important thing for President Trump right now is not to stop the pressure. And that means, uh, as we heard uh, National Security Advisor Chung say, we can't stop the pressure. We need to actually pull it on, more mm -hmm. on because the North Koreans will give up their nukes eventually if they have no other choice. They're not there yet, Aaron, but we can yeah. push them there in about six months. All right. Uh, all of you stay with me. More of our breaking news coverage of this uh, stunning moment here and the president of the United States agreeing to meet with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, this spring by May. We'll be right back. And we're back with the breaking news tonight. President Trump agreeing to meet with Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, by May. An unprecedented move and a stunning development uh, in a relationship that has included a volley of nasty insults, right? Leader of North Korea calling Trump a doter, Trump calling him little rocket man, uh, threatening annihilation. I want to go to Will Ripley in Seoul because, Will, you have some new information. I mean, the thing that really seemed to just knock people over here was that President Trump said, yes, I will meet with you and I will do it by May. You have some information. Why May? Well, May, because uh, President Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un are going to be meeting at some point in April. And so ahead of that meeting and ahead of this uh, presidential summit between Trump and Kim in May, there's obviously a lot of groundwork that's going to be laid out. But, uh, you know, all sides appear to want to be seizing on this momentum here that was first gained when the inter-Korean talks were revived in January. They picked up during the Olympics, even though the U.S. and North Korea never had any meaningful interaction in Pyeongchang. Uh, obviously now, Kim Jong-un has calculated that this is the time to deal with the United States. And if you think about it, uh, it makes sense. I've been ch chatting with sources who, who say that really Kim Jong-un is probably looking at the scenario. He thinks that Trump is, is somebody who could make a one-shot man who could skip all the bureaucracy, make a, a realistic decision on the fly without having to go through all the steps that other previous U.S. presidents have done. So perhaps mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un thinks that President Trump could be the one to achieve what he wants, which is, you know, they work out some sort of a deal where Kim says he'll freeze his nuclear program in exchange for what North Korea wants, which is limited, you know, recognition as a nuclear state, a more normalized relationship with the U.S. I mean, Kim Jong-un has been studying President Trump, and he knows that face-to-face -face meetings are the way to do it. Yep. And so, you know, you talk about the charm offensive at the Olympics. Well, this is going to take the charm offensive to a whole new level, Aaron. And, and I also wanted to talk briefly about the significance of the letter, because in the Western world, it might seem uh, kind of crazy for people to think that, you know, there's so much important attached to letters. But when you're inside North Korea, documents, letters are everything. Letters are the most formal way that a message can be delivered. They hold the highest significance. You remember that China's President Xi Jinping also wrote a letter to Kim Jong-un. So the fact that Kim Jong-un sent President Trump a letter, this is about the highest form of communication that he could do to show he respects President Trump mm. and he's ready to sit down at the table and try to make a deal, obviously for the benefit of his country and his interests. And obviously respect is, is, is so very crucial in terms of what President Trump wants and the significance of this. All right. Will, stay with us. I want to bring into the conversation now uh, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby, uh, who, of course, uh, was the spokesperson for both the Pentagon and the State Department through many conversations uh, with North Korea. Admiral Kirby, thank you very much. Uh, you heard what Will Ripley just reported. Uh, one shot man. And that uh, Kim Jong-un thinks this is his chance. Yeah. President Trump is the guy who could cut through all the bureaucratic tape and get this done. 
Is this actually a great endorsement and a victory for President Trump? Yeah, let me tell you something else about the dynamics on the timing here, Aaron. It's not just about Donald Trump. It's about Moon Jae-in. Kim Jong-un knows very well that he may never, not get another shot like this with, a, with as such a liberal president of South Korea, somebody who is almost tripping over himself to engage and to make something happen. And the other thing we have to think is that it's not just... Kim Jong-un here being cowed by Donald Trump. I, yes, I think Will's right that the, the sanctions are biting. Certainly he's a little bit concerned by the military uncertainty, but so too are our allies in South Korea. President Trump has rattled them. So when we talk about what's bringing this about and the timing behind it, it has almost as much to do with the tensions and the feelings and the fear south of, uh, of that DMZ as it does with the, the uncertainty uh, to the north. But is all of that, uh, Admiral, about Donald Trump. Yeah, so he's the guy who's created. I mean, is this a different moment on every single level than it was with Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, yeah. right? President after president who failed. Is this different and is it different because of one person, Donald it Trump? Does, it, it certainly does feel like a different moment to me. I don't think you can look at tonight's uh, developments and not say that it is. And I do think that President Trump deserves some of the credit here because the sanctions that he put in place and the international pressure is starting to have an effect. Because he has created uncertainty in the minds of both the South and the North about what he might do militarily, yes, he gets credit for that. But two other things are really important. Aaron. One, Kim is not his father. He has more credibility at a negotiating table now because he has more capability militarily, and he's not going to give that up anytime soon. And so he knows he's going into this with a bit of an upper hand. Number two is Moon Jae-in, as we just talked about. Yeah. He, Moon Jae-in is the other factor here that we haven't really discussed. It's because of he wants to engage so much. Kim knows that. Kim's taking advantage of that. And he, to some degree, he's kind of running the table here. All right, and uh, let's go back to our team of experts. Sam, let me go back to you. You obviously were part of, of, of whatever conversations, intermediaries there were uh, with President Obama. Does this moment feel different to you with this extraordinary development tonight of a meeting between Trump and Kim? It does, but that doesn't mean that we should rush into a nuclear summit. Erin, we would spend months preparing for the most basic meetings that President Obama used to have. Talk to your intelligence community, talk to your diplomats. There is no way that President Trump can be ready by May to have a high-stakes negotiation on denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. It's just impossible. So we're looking at a scenario now where the president, perhaps because he wants a PR opportunity, because, perhaps because he's desperate to do a deal, is going to be rushing into a nuclear negotiation. And guess what? You can't wing it. Kim Jong-un is going to be fully prepared. I think that he's playing to the president's ego and the president's weaknesses by flattering him and by inviting him to Pyongyang. But this is a major concession. If President Trump does meet with Kim Jong-un, he's going to be going in unprepared, and he's going to be giving to Kim what Kim wants, which is a positive photo op. I mean, Elise, is that what it is between these two? And then, because if that's the way it is, Trump is going to want, you, you see him in every one of these televised true. meetings. But let me, he doesn't want the process. He wants to come in and say, true. I'll do it. That's true. But let me just play devil's advocate this time. Yeah. Okay? They're not going to sit down to a nuclear negotiation and come out in one day with a deal. We're talking about a meeting. We're talking about talks. Maybe they sit down and they agree that they're going to give their technical experts or Secretary Tillerson and their mm. envoys, they're going to start negotiations. I don't think... So it's really we're, then we're just a face-to-face -to -face, It's a right, face-to-face. Right, -face. Could it be a photo op? Yes. Could it be a start of something, a warming of tensions? It's been mm. pretty tense on the Korean Peninsula. I do think this is different. I agree with Will Ripley entirely that Kim Jong-un sees that President Trump might be the you know most favorable deal he's going to get. And if he's going to do something, he might as well try and do it now. I think you have to trust but verify. And right. the U.S. is not going to just give away everything. President Trump does have good advisors around him. I think it is a different moment. I think it's significant. I think President Trump, as we've said, does deserve credit for this maximum uh, pressure campaign working, but I think you need to be skeptical about yeah. what the North Koreans are going to do. Well, and, and, and you know, on that front, Phil, what does happen with the North Koreans, right? I mean, because again, you got to look at history. They, they have allowed inspectors in before. They have said they're going to freeze before. They have said they're not going to test before, and every single time they have. And it would seem to defy reason that they would give up all of their nuclear program in a completely verifiable way, which of course is what this administration has said they have to do. Well, so let's cut to the chase. The question is, is it different? Let me give you my answer. Hell no. Hmm. I mean, you have a, a 
a South Korean advisor who just walked out of the West Wing and didn't talk about denuclearization, which is what the president's been talking about. He talked about a freeze. So the president shows up at the table. He says, we're going to freeze in a place where the North Koreans have, have already proven to us mm -hmm. that they have a nuclear capability. If you're the North Koreans, you're saying, in the past five minutes, I just won. So the conversation is whether we test more, not whether we denuclearize. I don't buy this for a second. I think the North Koreans have won. I would do this if I were the president. Who knows what the North Koreans will show up with? I think the sanctions are having some impact. But I would place the chance that we see something on denuclearization over the past, let's over the next, let's say, 6, 12, 24 mm -hmm. months at somewhere between zero and 20 percent. No better. Which is interesting. You know, Gordon, there was an interesting article in The Wall Street Journal the other day that went through uh, a little bit of what Will Ripley was talking about. You know, the Chinese trucks at the border and how the borders are empty. There's been all kinds of problems. And really, China is stepping up to the plate has made a huge difference, obviously, as the most significant trading partner. That same article, though, still said from their reporting that wealthy North Koreans were still able to get everything that they wanted. Now, who knows what the exact situation on the ground is? Gordon, what's your perception? How dire are the straits of the things that Kim Jong-un cares about, right? His fancy cars, his fancy alcohol, his women, all the things that provide, you know, the lifestyle that he wants to maintain. Has that truly been damaged to a level he's willing to negotiate? Well, I think that there has been certainly a substantial reduction in the money going to the regime. You know, and we saw that with that soldier who defected on November 13th. Um, he had uncooked kernels of corn in his uh, digestive tract, mm -hmm. indicating he was scrounging for food. And, and he worms, was the best right? of the best. Well, the worms we know yeah. about because North Korea uses excrement for fertilizer. But the uncooked kernels of corn were actually significant. Mm -hmm. and because this guy is best of the best. He's in the joint security area. North Korea has every incentive to keep him fed, and they didn't do it. And Aaron, just by one thing, yes. I, I think that, that Kim Jong-un and President Trump are trying to influence President Moon, and that's why they're making statements they ordinarily wouldn't make. General Marks, let me ask you about one other thing that was said here. Often, you know, you get these tests and this anger from North Korea when the joint exercises, the standard joint exercises between the U.S. and South Korea happen. Um, you know, we've all been uh, in South Korea around when this happens. This was very explicit tonight the South Korean envoy saying that Kim Jong-un accepts that the joint exercises between the U.S. and South Korea must continue. How significant is that? That Kim Jong-un was willing to put that on the table. Is that something or not? Oh, it is something, and it's huge, quite frankly. Um, I would think Kim would run the risk of being viewed as, as um, irrelevant and, in fact, not being taken seriously if he were not to acknowledge that the coalition, the South Korean-U.S. coalition, military coalition on the peninsula, is one of the best in the world and has been there for 70 years. He has to acknowledge that that's not going away and that their rhythm of exercises and joint connections and that that command is going to continue to exist in some capacity. The fact that he acknowledged that realize, makes us realize there might be something real here Yep. But again, we have to be incredible. A large dose of skepticism has to be taken with all of this. All right. Well, thanks very much to all of you. Just an extraordinary evening. And of course, opening the door to the big question. If President Trump can truly solve this problem. Uh, that would be going down as a great president. And there's no way around that. That is the reality here. Thank you all. And next, New